Good evening and welcome. For members of the media, the event tonight is on the record. Due to some technical difficulties, we will not have closed captioning live, but we will add it for the recording that will be posted after um, the webinar is done tonight. I'm Matthew Keller, Chair of the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh's Aging and Human Needs Commission. I'm also a board member of the Jewish Federation of North America and serve as co-chair of the Disability Committee. Tonight's event is being co-hosted by the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh and Jewish Residential Services. The mission of Federation is to create a thriving, vibrant, and engaged Jewish community by raising and allocating funds and building community locally in Israel and around the world. Jewish Residential Services supports individuals with psychiatric, developmental, or intellectual disabilities, helping them to live, learn, work, and socialize as valued members of our community. We are holding this event in celebration of Jewish Disability Awareness, Acceptance, and Inclusion Month. Established in 2009, JDAME is a month when Jewish organizations worldwide can unite to raise awareness and foster acceptance and inclusion of people with disabilities and those that love them. For the past 10 years, the Federation and JRS have participated in Jewish Disability Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill. While we are not able to participate in person this year, we are so fortunate to be able to host virtual events like tonight that include so many more participants. More than 30 years since the enactment of the Americans with Disabilities Act, numerous health disparities and overarching systemic challenges still create barriers for people with disabilities. The COVID-19 pandemic has magnified these inequities. For example, according to a recently published study, people with intellectual disabilities had almost doubled the risk of dying from the virus if infected compared to the general population. In our community, like many others, we have seen an interruption of in-person learning and care coupled with accessibility challenges due to a lack of appropriate technology. Through Federation's COVID-19 relief campaign, JRS clients receive technology to enable them to connect to JRS programs, their families, and friends in order to combat isolation. This is just one example of how our community provides support during this difficult time. Tonight, we are going to explore how we can break down some of the barriers and make our community more inclusive for people of all abilities. A few housekeeping notes. Everyone will be muted throughout the event. We'll have a question and answer with Matan Koch, and we'll collect your questions throughout the event. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will be recording this event and we'll send the recording to you afterwards. And like I said, we will include closed captioning then. It is now my honor to welcome Rabbi Danny Schiff, Foundation Scholar at the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh to share a Devar Torah with us tonight. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be able to offer some words of Torah in recognition of Jewish Disability Awareness, Acceptance, and Inclusion Month that we are currently observing. And as it happens, of course, it coincides with the Hebrew month of Adar, which means that just 24 hours from now, we're going to be celebrating Purim. And as you're aware, at, at the very heart of Purim is the reading of the Megillah, the scroll of Esther, which tells the history of Mordechai and Esther and the Jews of Shushan and the Persian Empire and how they struggled against anti-Semitic tyranny in their day. 
Nothing, of course, is by chance in Jewish life. And we get instructions for how we are supposed to read the Megillah at Purim in the tractate of the Talmud, which is appropriately called Megillah. And it lays out for us the various different important ideas about the Megillah and how indeed it should be read at this time of the year. And after it's done explaining the Megillah, it goes on to deal with other liturgical issues in Jewish life. And one of the particular points that it raises is the question of the priestly blessing, the threefold blessing delivered by the Kohanim to the Jewish people. And it gives specific instructions as to how the priestly blessing should be carried out. And one of the observations that the Talmud makes is that a priest who has blemished hands shouldn't raise his hands in front of the Jewish people to deliver the priestly blessing. And then the Talmud elaborates further. A priest who has a blemish on his face or markings on his legs, he shouldn't participate. He's prohibited from being part of delivering the priestly blessing as well. And then it adds other disabilities. A, a priest who has clouded, blurry vision shouldn't participate in delivering the priestly blessing. And just when you think that this is a text that seems to put a whole group of people to one side in a category of being unacceptable in terms of delivering the priestly blessing for reasons that are entirely beyond their control. The Talmud makes an extraordinary observation. It tells us of a priest in a certain town who was well known, familiar to the rabbis and the locals in that particular place, and who was permitted, despite the blemishes that he had, accepted to pronounce the priestly blessing. And then it tells of a priest in another town who was familiar, accepted, well known by the rabbis and the local community, and he too was permitted to take part. And then it gives a third example. And by the time one comes to the end of the passage, one begins to understand that although there had been this sense that a priest who had a disability ought to be excluded from the participation in Birkat Kohanim, in the delivery of the priestly blessing, nevertheless, the Talmud essentially contravenes its own instruction. And from place to place, it tells us about various individuals who are able, notwithstanding the law, to take part. Why? What made a difference in the case of those particular Kohanim? And the answer is clear. Ultimately, it's all about relationships. Ultimately, it's all about familiarity. Those things that once seemed an obstacle, those items that seemed strange and that called forth a prohibition in the abstract legal response of the Talmud itself, when put to the test in a particular spot, in a place where people knew an individual, where people had become familiar with that individual, where people had come to know and love a human being for what that human being really represented. In that location, the prohibitions fell away. The Talmud itself reminds us in tractate 
Megillah, the tractate so connected to this very week, that where there is the possibility for really getting to know somebody, where familiarity can overcome the gulf that so often separates between a person who might seem strange or disconcerting and the rest of the population. When that gulf can be bridged by relationship, by acceptance, and by inclusion, then the barriers that we thought might need to be there so often seem irrelevant, so often seem like we can't even recall why we put them there in the first place. And perhaps during the course of this month, perhaps as we contemplate Purim and Tractate Megillah and what it communicates, perhaps what we really ought to remember is that at the core of acceptance is the building of familiarity and the building of bridges of love and connection. That's the foundation for how this month ought to be really shaped in our minds. And that, after all, is the message of Purim, that those who were once outsiders, those who were once strangers, can become fully a part of a society if that society will only open its eyes and embrace those in its midst. In this month of inclusion of those with disabilities, we too commit ourselves once again to the process that the Talmud reminds us is so very central. The process of opening our eyes to the human beings in our midst, looking beyond the blemishes, looking beyond the disabilities, and trying once again to embrace the full person as they really are within our community. Ken Yihiratso. Hello, everyone. I'm Jerry Sperling. I'm president of Jewish Residential Services. And first of all, I want to thank Rabbi Schiff for the very beautiful and meaningful Devar Torah. I want to say that we are thrilled to have with us tonight longtime national disability advocacy and inclusion leader, Matan Koch. Matan is the director of Respectability California and Jewish Leadership at Respectability, a nonprofit organization um, fighting stigmas and advancing opportunities so that people with disabilities can fully participate in all aspects of their community. A longtime national leader um, in disability advocacy and a wheelchair user himself, Matan leads Project Moses, uh, which is Respectability Los Angeles' based Jewish leadership project. And he is also on the front lines in many other aspects of Respectability's work, including disability inclusion in philanthropy and nonprofits, Jewish outreach and impact, leadership and legal affairs. Matan was a Senate-confirmed Obama appointee to the National Council on Disability. As an inclusion expert, he has developed training and materials for many Jewish organizations, including Hillel International, the Union for Reform Judaism, and Combined Jewish Philanthropies. Matan has also spoken and taught law firms and Johnson & Johnson, a big corporation. Matan recently finished a term on the Advisory Council 
of Jewish Vocational Services of Boston as their disability subject matter expert. As a graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School, Matan began his career as counsel to Procter & Gamble. He then transitioned to an AMLAW 100 law firm in New York, New York and was recognized as a rising star by New York super lawyers in 2012 and 2013, based upon peer recognition and professional achievement. He was also awarded the Legal Aid Society Outstanding Pro Bono Services Award in 2013 for his pro bono work. Matan sits on JFNA's Jewish Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Council, which is also known as the Jedi Council. He grew up steeped in Jewish organizations and has spoken at numerous synagogues, Jewish institutions and camps. We are so fortunate to have Matan here tonight. And now I'm going to turn it over to Matan. Please submit any questions you may have for him in the Q&A box. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I want to thank everyone who's here tonight, even though I can't see you. I want to thank you for being here. And more than that, I want to thank the commitment by the Pittsburgh Jewish community that having this event uh, reflects the statement uh, that you want to begin a conversation about how you can build on the inclusion already practiced by your community and, and kick it up a notch. And I do hope that what happens here during my remarks and during the Q&A that will follow those remarks is that we begin a conversation that you will keep having once I'm gone. I'm here for, you know, a little over an hour, but I hope that what begins uh, goes into the year to come and the years to follow to build really, uh, you know, a model of an inclusive Jewish community. So I want to start with a story, and, and it's a story that has, you know, a point, as most of my stories do, especially for this type of thing. Um, and it really starts with the notion that I am one of those folks, and every Jewish community has them, that, uh, that, that's just omnipresent, right? I, I end up doing some form of, uh, of Jewish leadership help in lots of different places, uh, and, you know, where sort of there's utility players that Jewish communities need, and, and I'm privileged to be able to do it outside of my professional life, which obviously is focused on the disability inclusion. And I'd like to start with a story of one of the first times I got to do that when I was a freshman in college of all things. I was a freshman in college. It was probably the second week of my freshman year, maybe my third, but it was clearly one of my first Shabbat dinners as an undergraduate, and I got a tap on the shoulder, and I looked, and there was the head of, or one of the co-chairs of the Reform Group on campus, the Reform Jewish Group on campus, saying, you know, this is a weird request, but my co-chair has to step down. We've heard that you were a Jewish leader in high school. Might you be able to step up, even though you've only been here for three weeks, and and become the co-chair of the Reformed Jewish community here. And it, it was a strange request, but I said yes, and it was a role that I served in for the next few years. But the reason that I start there is the only re way that I was able to say yes at that moment is because I'd been a nifty leader and I'd attended the URJ's Kutz Leadership Academy. Before that, I'd been a participant in NIFTY. Before that, I had been a camper at URJ camps and, you know, so on and so forth and the children of Jewish education, what have you. And obviously, even if we weren't here talking about disability inclusion, every Jewish community could wish for more such utility players that have some set of background where we can tap the shoulders. But I was only able to do that 
because I had been included in all of those places, because those places had been made accessible to me in one way or the other. You know, I was attending Jewish camp as a person with a disability in the 80s, long before lots of other people were doing it, because it didn't occur to anyone to tell uh, the child of my parents, who were leaders in that community, that there wasn't a way for their kid to go to camp. I was uh, you know, a youth group officer and everything else at a time before kids with disabilities were doing that because trails were blazed and things were done to help me do it. But the ultimate role point is that the Jewish community got a leader because they made opportunities accessible, because they made opportunities inclusive. Now, I bet that many of the people watching right now, as you ponder, can think of some potential leaders in Pittsburgh, some who you do get access to because of inclusion that, that has been made, because of access that has been done, and some that you can think, oh, maybe we should step up our access game a little bit so that we can have access to their leadership. But oddly enough, those are not the folks I want you to be thinking about right now. The folks I want you to be thinking about right now, and in fact, kind of want you to be haunted by, are the ones that you might not even know about. And I wanted to focus you on this idea by telling you a story. Think to some portion of this community, whether it's the Federation, whether it's your congregation, Think of a great leader, and the only qualification I'm going to give you to that great leader is that they can't have been born and bred here for the example to work. So a great leader who came to town. And in this scenario, they came to town, and let's use a synagogue because it makes the story a little easier. They came to town and they did what we in the Jewish community like to call shul shopping. And before they went shul shopping, because they're the organized sort that becomes a Jewish leader, they made a list of the shuls they wanted to see. And in this timeline, the timeline we're living in, if you will, uh, they came to your shul. They loved it so much that they didn't check out anywhere else. They joined. They've never looked back. And they've become the leader that you know and love. But let's posit a different timeline. Let's posit a timeline where the day they were going to come check out your shul in their shul shopping, they got a flat tire. They stayed home that night, you know, may, you know, did whatever they did at home. And next week, they went to the next shul on the list, fully intending to double back to yours. But it turns out that the next place on their list was also wonderful because there's more than one wonderful place to daven in Pittsburgh, right? And they, they ended up staying there and they never made it back to circle to your shul and for want of a flat tire this leader this person who's quintessential to your communal experience uh never got there and you never knew what you missed out on because you didn't know that in a different timeline they would have come to your shul first i want to posit for you that the, an access barrier is like a flat tire in this way. Who rolled up to your synagogue in a wheelchair but couldn't get in? Who came to your synagogue with a sensory-related uh, disability, had no one to you know, say they were deaf, hard of hearing, uh, or, or blind, and had no one to welcome them, no access features created, and so they turned away? And you never really noticed who you didn't who you didn't get to interact with because they were turned away so quickly, and you have no idea who you missed out on, what leader you missed out on. And then let's take it a step further. That same scenario could be applied to the best friend you never knew you didn't have, to the person that was going to be the great friend to your child, to the person who was going to become your go-to person and to swap recipes with. If I leave you all with one idea at the end of this talk, I want you wondering who you are not getting the benefit from 
precisely because they didn't have the access to join you. And I want that to be the focus that drives efforts towards greater inclusion, because it's one thing I learned both in my career as a lawyer and as a student of human nature, it's that we always do a little bit better when we realize what the benefit could be for us and our community, rather than framing it in terms of what we're doing for them, for those people, the ones that don't have access. No, it's what you're missing out on. Now, it wouldn't be very helpful if I came in and got you all concerned about the people you're missing out on and didn't talk to you about how you might make your community more able to to take advantage of them. Obviously, it starts with low-hanging fruit, some of it that you guys are probably already doing in some, in some congregations and communities, some that you still want to work on. Caption your videos so that those who, uh, you know, the, the roughly um, 40 million Americans that access content that way can access it. Make your website screen reader accessible so that all those who might want to visit who are, uh, who are uh, dependent on screen reader software can access your website. Physical access. Basically, we at Respectability have a whole webinar series that you can visit for this low-hanging fruit uh, where we give you seven hours worth of content for this, what I'll call the easy stuff. And start there, because that'll take you a really large portion of the way. But I wasn't asked to come here tonight and just talk to you about the low-hanging fruit. I was asked to come here tonight and, and talk to you about what would it really mean to make Pittsburgh an inclusive community? What would it mean to take it to the next level? And so in order to do that, I have to take you back. Though I've been speaking on these topics since I was very, very young, I always felt a tension in myself when I was young. The tension between this notion that we should accommodate those of us who had disabilities, and yet the notion that, honestly, there was nothing special about the fact that I had a disability. The fact that I had a disability meant that it was just a little easier to quantify the things that were challenging for me than for folks uh, whose things that are challenging for them were not labeled, were not focused, were not subject to a law or subject to a condition. And it was only, uh, you know, less than 10 years ago that I finally was able to resolve this tension between the obvious need to accommodate and this notion that I didn't particularly think that disability was a strong standalone topic. And let me tell you the story of how I got there and let us go from there. So I was still working as a lawyer at this time and the Ruderman Family Foundation was publishing a blog on inclusion topics fairly regularly. And one day I read this haunting blog post. And the haunting blog post was about a woman with two children if I'm remembering correctly, they were both on the autism spectrum who was talking about having been ostracized from congregation after congregation and after congregation until finally she found her welcome, her place of welcome in a church. Because in, a, in the church she walked into, they just accepted her and her family for, for who they were. And in the activism of my generation, I posted this to my Facebook wall, which was always frequented by the you know, hundreds of childhood friends who became Jewish professionals. And I simply said, guys, I think we can do better than this. I think we ought to do better than this. And, and most people just agree. Right? It, was, it was not, I thought, a particularly controversial post. But one friend of someone I actually consider very thoughtful posted that the one thing about the story that, that concerned him was that nowhere in the story does it say that she reached out to the rabbi, to the board, to the powers that be to explain the situation, why her children 
uh, moved around differently, why they needed that uh, um, that uh, extra difference as he as he would have characterized it in service. Uh, and I thought about this for a bit because I take questions from people I respect fairly seriously. But then I simply said, well, should she have had to? Right? Does it make a difference if we can put a why on why this is what her children needed to be welcome and successful in our congregations? I respectfully submit that it does not. I respectfully submit that, first of all, that creates distinctions we don't like. Distinctions between people who had the privilege of access to a diagnosis to people who did not have that privilege for one reason or another. But more than that, it's distinctions between people whose reason for needing what is often called accommodation is deserving or righteous versus someone else is, you know, equally clear need to be accepted in our community. And I thought about this and I, and I frame it this way. I'm a lawyer by training, and the reason that we focus so much in the law on what is or is not a disability is to provide a gatekeeping function to expensive legal benefits. But in our Jewish community and in our communities of worship, we don't really want to provide a gatekeeping function. Rather, I think we want to throw the gates of welcome wide open. And so... Because the question is this, if one person needs to sit in a particular point in the sanctuary because they have a diagnosed hearing disability, or one person needs to sit in a particular point in the sanctuary because they have a diagnosed visual impairment, but one person has to sit in a point in the sanctuary because that's just the only place they've ever felt comfortable in the sanctuary, Do we really feel like we need to cause that third person to get a diagnosis of some identified mental health condition before we're willing to let them sit where they need to be in the sanctuary? No, we want to help them to join to to join in and to pray. So ultimately, to me, a truly inclusive community is one where we acknowledge certain facts. We acknowledge that everyone might encounter barriers to feeling fully included in our community. Those barriers might be familial or socioeconomic or geographic, or they could be disability related. And in either case, building an inclusive community is about finding out how to lower those barriers so that people can join. The Devar Torah was wonderful and focused in on the notion of building relationship, of building community. But more broadly, as I read that passage, what it also focuses in on is the notion of widening our definition of what is normal, widening our definition of what is us, widening our definition of what a member of our community looks like, what a community, what a member of our community acts like, what a member of our community prays like. Once we can come to that place as an attitude, as an idea, as a focus, then difference drops away and accommodation simply becomes the acknowledgement that all of us occasionally need an accommodation whatever that means, to be comfortable and welcome in our community. And if the community can do it, we do. And sadly, because I feel like I must acknowledge this for realism's sake, if the community can't do it, if the need is simply beyond the ability of a particular community to meet, the fact that a person may have a disability versus an undiagnosed or unarticulated need isn't going to make that community more able to meet the need, or at least it shouldn't if we're really trying our best. I want to leave you with a closing thought that if we're lucky, then means we'll get to our Q&A a little bit early, two or three minutes early, which is good because 
I like to answer questions. So the, the, the idea, the thought I want to leave you with is how can we all be so different and yet still be created B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God? And the best explanation that I've ever encountered for this idea is that God is so vast that each of us in our uniqueness represents a small portion of that image. If that is in fact the case, then the more we open up the vision of our community to a broader percentage of the whole, the greater space we're creating for that aspect of God. To be clear then, some aspect of God is the aspect of God that has my particular mobility impairments because I'm a reflection of one small portion of the image of God. So when a place is made accessible to me, we open it up a little more to God. And that is the case for every single person and with every single difference. And I would posit for you that our greatest holy obligation as a people is to build a place for God to dwell among us. And if we want to thus reflect the greatest and most wondrous diversity of the divine among us, then we want to become the most inclusive community possible. With that thought, I'd love to welcome Jerry back so that we can engage in some Q&A and have a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Matan. As a parent of a, an adult child on the autism spectrum, your words were very um, meaningful to me personally. Um, we do have some questions. The first question is, what is the best way to help Jewish communities increase comfort with and knowledge about how to be welcoming to people with disabilities. So I'm going to answer that in two ways. On the one hand, well, three ways, because, you know, you can tell I come from a rabbinic family. Like I'm never satisfied with one answer. The first is plenty of tips and tricks and tactics on things like the respectability website, which I'm sure is somewhere in the materials for this event. When it comes to practical strategies, their place is to go with resources. But I'm going to jump away from that pretty quickly and suggest two things. The second portion is what we at Respectability like to refer to as ask the person, which is to say, generally, the person who is the greatest expert in what will make a particular person feel welcome and included is probably the person themselves, or sometimes if we're talking about a younger person, their parent or whoever it is, is, you know, uh, most familiar with. And so you can never go wrong by starting with the simple question, what will work for you? And if what the person offers, the thing that will make them feel most comfortable, most included, is something that's within the community's capability to do, just do that, right? Like why, you know, and then the third thing that I would offer, and this is most consistent with my remarks, is a huge part of it's up here. A huge part of it is in our attitude and in our thoughts. And looking at someone who doesn't move the way we do, communicate the way we do, quite act the way we do, and slowly conditioning ourselves to the notion, this is just another facet of who we are. Just like not everyone looks quite like I do, has the same hair color, talks the same way, is the same height, yada, 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 yada. And the only way to get there, by the way, is to find people who are in the business of letting you ask questions of them, because you shouldn't impose upon people who don't wish to, and getting your questions answered so you can get to a place of comfort. If there's a disability you want to know more about, start by Googling and then see who you might be able to have a conversation with to increase your knowledge. But don't, don't put the emotional labor on random folks that you encounter who happen to have a particular disability, but don't do it for a living to be your particular guidepost. That is neither uh, fair nor appropriate. That's actually really helpful. Um, another question that, that has come up, 
What do you think is the biggest barrier to disability inclusion? Is it attitude? Is it lack of disability confidence or awareness? Or is it both? It's an interesting question. And I think to some extent, there are two sides of the same coin, right? Because in today's day and age, where we have things like the internet and, you know, websites and Google, a lack of knowledge can only be a question of attitude. It can only be a decision not to learn more. There was a time when I was a child when quite legitimately you could just not know, and despite your best efforts, you might not know where to turn. We didn't have an internet uh, because of the lack of the ADA, which was passed when I was 10. There wasn't even widespread knowledge in the world uh, of, of disability more generally. But in today's day and age, I would argue that there's not a great distinction because uh, once you embrace the attitude to include, you can find out more about how to do it. So how much progress do you think the Jewish community in particular has made um, in inclusion of the, over the past several years? And, and how much progress do you think we've made? And how should we measure progress? Hmm. So I'm going to play with that answer a little bit as good advocates and good rabbis' children do, um, and say it is not useful for us to focus on how much progress we have or haven't made because we are where we are and we can certainly do better, right? So even if we're 10 times better than we were 10 years ago, now is not the moment to stop and pat ourselves on the back. Now is the moment to say, okay, we are where we are, and let's do it. Now, in terms of measurement, in terms of measurement, to me, there's only one measure that actually matters. How many uh, Jews in how, with how many different disabilities are participating in a meaningful way in our community? If we are anywhere less than everyone who wants to is participating to the degree that they want to, then we haven't done enough. And the closer that we get to that aspiration, the closer that we are to where we want to be. And the only measure that is of any value in my mind is where were we, where are we, and how can we get better? Wow. That, that's a really important perspective. We want to have everybody be able to participate to the extent that they can want to. So often families or individuals may be reluctant to reach out to Jewish organizations to become engaged for, for a multitude of re reasons. What suggestion do you have for outreach? What can we do as a community to convey that we're welcoming to people of all abilities? I think we have to start by if you'll pardon the expression from a wheelchair user, walking the walk, right? You you can only you can only start by practicing inclusion on every level that you can by making sure that every event is interpreted and every event is captioned and that every video is captioned and physical access is just a given and sensor access is just a given and everywhere has an allergy policy and a fragrance policy and all the things you could find on our website that I called low hanging fruit. I don't think it's actually worthwhile to spend a lot of time talking about how inclusive we are. What is worthwhile is to spend time doing it so that people can see it and then to therefore um, and to therefore go from uh, from one spot to another. And the only thing I would say that is worth doing is put some version, and this is one of our simple recommendations, but I'll highlight it here. In every registration and in every sign up, 
in every lobby, in every access point of the Jewish community. Put some note that indicates your desire to, uh, you know, to be, to help in whatever way that you can and gives a clear contact person that someone can contact if they have an access need that is not being met. That simple communication everywhere is a signpost to every it's to everyone that walks in the door ah they're thinking about me ah they may not be able to do it who knows everything i need but they certainly are going to give it a shot i'm on the radar screen i matter that's great advice so i don't know if you've had to address this question frequently or not but how do you see the pandemic impacting disability inclusion going forward in the future? So it's really interesting that in many ways, the pandemic has actually vastly improved uh, access and inclusion. And so the question is going to be, to what extent we maintain our gains even as we fold things in. Let me give a couple examples. This first one is unabashedly uh, borrowed from my friend, Rabbi Lauren Tuckman, who has said it multiple times and was recently quoted in the foreword uh, making the same statement. Um, you can find her article in, I think, the most recent, uh, recent foreword uh, that talks about how she is a blind rabbi, first of all. And one of the things that she speaks of is that for years and years and years, the major Sidur publishers all said, we can't digitize our Jewish material. We can't make it available in electronic formats that would be more accessible to you. That is too difficult. And the moment that we all went virtual and everyone suddenly needed a PDF of their praying materials, all of a sudden, everybody's doing it. So what we need to do is make sure that not only do those losses, not those attitudes not reconvene when we go when we come back but that we keep pushing forward secondly i am a person with a mobility impairment that means that every time i need to travel somewhere it's a bit of a challenge but honestly i'm on the low end of that for folks who are older for folks who are you know who for whatever reason again sometimes socioeconomic sometimes otherwise can't get around simply getting to events at a synagogue or a jcc can be challenging now some things will always be better in person it's just great to stand and pray with everyone together or sit and pray hear that music all that stuff but i was talking with a rabbi friend the other day and he pointed out that his weeknight shirim, his weeknight Jewish Talmud lessons, have never been better attended than they are now that they're on Zoom because lots of people who didn't have time to drive through the L.A. traffic to the synagogue now find that they can jump on a Zoom. And so I'm hoping we won't lose the, the extra access that that has given the last being, of course, and this is a perfect example. I don't know to put our interpreter on the spot for a moment where uh, you're coming to us from, but because you're on a Zoom camera, you could be coming to us from anywhere in the country. And captioning and interpretation have made access for those who are uh, you know, deaf or hard of hearing so much easier and are so much easier to do now that we've gone virtual that, again, I hope we find some way to hold on to that value even as we begin to come back from the pandemic. Now, that is not to say the pandemic hasn't created tremendous challenges. As bad as the job losses have been for the general public, the, I believe the job losses for people with disabilities have been two or three times as much, and they only had half the employment beforehand. And the, on and on. But that's a little bit on those questions. Can you speak as to how disability inclusion should go beyond an inclusion and diversity committee? Well, I'm going to flip the question a little bit and say, I don't ascribe any particular value to an inclusion and diversity committee. So 
I don't start there. In fact, in a guide that I published about how synagogues should should do this, I, I said you should probably form a committee because it's helpful to have multiple people working on the same on a topic to share labor, but that beyond that, the activity needs to be the activity of an entire congregation and that you need to be engaging a congregation and not a committee if you want to meaningfully practice. So I would start by saying, let's forget beyond the committee, let's think of the committee just as a small tool to advance the work. And the work starts with what I said in my remarks, which is actually building accessibility into our congregation. And then one further step, one further step. Reach out not to the folks that have time to join a committee, but to your full congregation and say, what barriers are you experiencing? What barriers are you finding? To quote a show that I quite enjoy, New Amsterdam, how can I help? And ask that question, you know, uh, to everyone, not just the folks who have the time and inclination to join a committee on the topic. That's really helpful. We're coming now to the end of the Q&A, and you've certainly given us a lot to think about. Are there any closing takeaways that you'd like to share with us? Well, I think before I get to closing takeaways, there, there seems to be someone who's put into the chat that they have a question. If you could actually put the oh, substance okay. of your question into the chat. Um, I already asked. Oh, it is a Ben Miller. If you can put your question into the chat box, we'll be happy to answer it. Um, uh, well, so while we're waiting for that to come into the box, what I'll say is I think the most important takeaway is that what we are doing here tonight is not about doing something for people with disability. It's not about being kind. It's not about being nice. It's not even about being just, although that's what my rabbi father would probably have said. It's actually about enriching our community by bringing more folks into it and the talents that they have to bring. I don't know if we've been able to get Mr. Miller's question. I'm not seeing it in the q and A. I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Um, well, if maybe. you could provide it afterwards to the organizers, Mr. Miller, perhaps they can get it back, get it to me, and we can get an answer back to you. Um, thank you for that. And does that bring us to the end of our of our uh, Q and A period? It, it, it does. Thank you so much. You've given us, as I said, a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matan, Jerry, and everyone um, involved for a great discussion tonight. If you do have questions, there will be a forum with a follow-up email um, where you can let us know, and we'll make sure that those questions get answered. Thank you to our event planning group made up of staff and volunteers at several organizations that are invested in inclusion. We need to continue this conversation. Matan gave us a wonderful vision of what an inclusive community can and should be and some great ideas on how to get there. One way you can get involved is by participating in the Federation's research on young adults with disabilities. As a follow-up to the community study done in 2017, the Federation is working in partnership with Pitt and the Jewish community organizations, including JRS, JFCS, the JCC, Friendship Circle, and others, on a research project to learn more about Jewish individuals between the ages of 16 and 30 with disabilities. A researcher from Pitt is conducting focus groups with different audiences individuals with disabilities themselves, caregivers, and organizations who are working to lower the barrier of entry into the Jewish community. You are all invited to participate. We're going to post a link in the chat to a quick survey 
that we're asking you to fill out later where you can include your interest in participating in a focus group. We'll also send this link out after the event is follow up. The results will be informative in shaping the future of inclusion in our community moving forward. Another way you can get involved is through advocacy. As the House weighs in on the COVID relief bill this week, it is critical that they prioritize funds to support people with disabilities. We are posting a link in the chat that will allow you to send a message to your representatives, urging them to act immediately to include critical lifelines for people with disabilities, including important funds for Medicaid and food assistance in the upcoming COVID relief bill. We've been through a lot over the past few years. When struck by violence in our community, we showed our resilience. When yet another wave of racial injustice surged, we joined with our neighbors and friends in solidarity. When a pandemic struck, we came together to support those most in need. When we look at our community through the lens of inclusion, what will we do? What will you do? It is time to move from disability awareness and acceptance into action. We hope that tonight's conversation brought new ideas for you to think about around inclusivity at your organization and in our community. We are committed to moving forward and moving the needle on inclusion and can't wait to partner with you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.